it's about 30 years since I've done anything like this and stood in front of an audience. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to, just to say that. Uh, so, first of all, a bit about me. Um, I qualified as a counsellor 10 years ago. I worked for 10 years in uh, one of the biggest agencies, counselling agencies in Edinburgh. I was a volunteer there for 10 years. Um, part of my reason for leaving was because of uh, a difference over um, a, a disagreement over how the response to COVID was being uh, conducted. I've also worked in private practice for the past eight years. I work mainly with adults, however I think um, much of what I see in my practice is actually the way that adults were treated as children is often what they're bringing to counselling. So what has happened to children over the past two and a half years is not something that they can just totally bounce back from. Um, I guess I, I really want to kind of make that clear. So I'm going to try and talk for about half an hour. Um, and actually, uh, I'm really interested in what your responses are to all of this. Um, I think one of the things that Richard said is this, this sense that we've all been really silenced. I think so much of the damage has been really um, hidden, but really, really colossal. Um, and perhaps we're seeing a lot more of that damage come out now. But even those of us who've maybe chosen not to participate in the medical experiment, so many of us are suffering a lot of kind of experienced a lot of loss and damage. Um, so these are the things I'm going to try and cover. I'll talk for about half an hour, but um, I'd really be interested to hear what your experiences are and actually what your observations are. I'm not putting myself up here as any kind of expert either. Um, I think it's taken, it's, it feels like a massive, massive subject. It's not something that I initially felt like I knew a huge amount about. But I think the past three years have taught me a huge amount of um, about actually what trauma is and what my own responses to trauma are. And I think because of that, it probably has made me a better practitioner. Um, but I'm certainly not, I'm not sitting here as any kind of expert, anybody who's got all of the answers. And in fact, I'm, I'm aware that there are quite a few people in the audience here tonight who probably know a bit more about me than trauma, who are actually kind of even more trained in that way so um, yeah the other thing I forgot to say is I'm also a member of an organization called UK Therapists for Medical Freedom this was set up um, towards the end of 2021 it was a collective of UK counselors and psychotherapists who felt re really really concerned about the level of coercion that we were seeing and the loss of our civil liberties which a lot of us felt was completely antithetical to the way that we wanted to practice as as therapists um, as you can probably imagine we're in a minority and um, this is one of the things that I'll come to, but it's one of the kind of maybe experiences of real betrayal that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling at the moment, a sense of betrayal by my own profession where they're not calling things out that are just so obviously, um, yeah, it obviously kind of some sort of psychological manipulation and warfare. So, yeah, my first, my first question I was going to look at is what is trauma? And then why is it important that we talk about this? So why is it important that we try and understand what trauma is? I'm then going to look at how people respond to threat. And this isn't necessarily kind of a, a negative thing. It's like we can all have healthy responses to threat. What are the factors that can lead to post-traumatic stress? And then how can we navigate and heal through all of this? So. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just go through those things sort of one by one. This word trauma gets banded around so much. It's a huge, huge area, and it's, it's probably quite difficult for most of us to, to get an idea of what it actually is. I think for me, these two pictures really um, convey the, the kind of sense of what trauma can be. Um, it can be something very, very violent. It can be a sort of shock, so what we would call shock trauma. And, and you can see on the left that kind of sense of the breaking, the violence. It can also be something much more insidious, something much more gradual. Um, and I think both of these images, in a way, really convey the sort of experience that we've been through over the past three years. Actually, the level of violence that has been done to society. 
Um, another trauma uh, therapist that I'm quite interested in was, um, was, was talking to a client, and this client referred to what his father had done to him as soul, soul murder. And I think in a way that really reflects the sort of um, the impact and the violence that has actually been done to so many people in society. And probably to, to an extent a lot of what of us are, a lot of, yeah, a lot of us are, are feeling that. I think this also shows the kind of fragmentation that happens in trauma, that when, when we experience a traumatic event, parts of us get really split off and often sort of go to war against each other. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But I think we can see this on an individual level. And then probably most of us here can probably agree we can see that very strongly on a collective level as well, how much we have fragmented as a society. We don't have a story that holds us together anymore. So many of us are at war with each other and you hear constantly this word the narrative are they in the narrative are they you know what controlling the narrative and it's almost as if that story that holds us all together as a collective is really breaking down um, okay so yeah, I just thought this, this quote was quite interesting. It's from a, a, a very well-known trauma researcher called Bessel van der Kolk. And uh, he says, in trauma, the self system breaks down and parts of the self become polarized and go to war with one another. So again, I think we can probably see this on an outer level. Many of us can probably see that, how, how that's really happening. But it's also what happens within us on a... Um, yeah, on an individual inner level. So I'm, I'm thinking from my own personal experience, I'm, I'm just aware of the kind of two parts of me, different parts of me, they're almost at war with each other. The part that really wants to speak out, and then sometimes the part that feels really, really afraid to say what I'm feeling in case, you know, in case something comes back at me. And, and the shame sometimes that I've been feeling for, for not doing that. So that's just an example of sometimes the, the tension that, that we feel when, when something um, yeah, in, in situations like this. So, um, yeah, this, this idea about kind of what trauma is, I think trauma can be, can be different things. It can be, for example, the experience of being in combat, the experience of, of being in a terrorist attack, the experience of, of of an accident, a really, yeah, a, a car accident, something like that. And that's normally what we would call a kind of shock trauma. But there are other kinds of traumas, I've said before, which could be like they're more relational and perhaps what we might call kind of developmental trauma. So as Richard said, the people who've probably been most affected by this are actually children. And, and the, the masking, um, if we've got time, I'll show you a video about that. But the masking is, is going to have a huge impact on kind of children's development. Um, and, and what another kind of uh, very famous trauma researcher called Peter Levine says is, trauma is not what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. And I, I, this might be something that some of you can resonate with, but um, for the first year of um, this whole um, catastrophe, in a way, I was desperately casting around for other people who felt like I did. There was nobody. They didn't see, other than my husband, there didn't seem to be anybody around who sort of could see what I saw or felt like I felt. Well, that's what it seemed to me. And in a way, this is, this is part of the experience of trauma where we don't have anybody who can reflect back, who can mirror, who can, who can validate what it is that we're feeling. And I think this is the most, um, for me, this is one of the most terrible things about um, the masking, actually, because um, children are not being mirrored. That it, it's almost as if there's this blankness, because it isn't just the words, it's also the facial, it's, it's, it's the whole body language, it's the facial expression that, that all of us are, that, that we were missing. And, and when children don't have that, it has a huge impact on their development. Um, and if we have time, I'll show you a video of um, a very famous experiment called the Still Face Experiment, which was done to look at the impact on children of, of a caregiver who had depression. Uh, but I think it's also very, very relatable to the, this idea of masking, children, of, of masking everybody because you, 
there's no reflection. You are not being mirrored. Um, and that in itself is, is traumatic. Um, so, yeah, it's not trauma isn't just an event that is, is necessarily really, really shocking. It, it can be much more. It can be much more insidious than that. It can be much more. It can be much more relational. So, yeah, wh why is it important that we understand what trauma is? Like, why, why do we need to know? Why, why should we care? Maybe children will just bounce back from this. Um, my feeling about that is that people don't bounce back from this easily. It's not something that we can just get over. Um, and one of the things that I think, I guess from my perspective, is that what's happened, what we are seeing happening from um, the, the powers that shouldn't be, in a way, is that many of these people, I would argue, are actually traumatized. And we are being pulled into that trauma story. So what happens when somebody is traumatized is they reenact that trauma and often other people get pulled into that. It's like traumatize people, traumatize others. So that's why it's really important for us all to kind of address our own kind of difficulties and insecurities. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that people have to go to therapy, but it's just, it's a sense of like, actually it's really important to understand this and for us to be able to, to, for us to be able to be aware of our own maybe things that have impacted us as well. Uh, I guess the other thing for me is that um, unresolved trauma can, well, it leads to um, many, many kind of different things. And actually people in the audience here will, I, I know that there's many of you here who will actually be able to um, be able to say more about this than me, but it can result in chronic illness, addictions, domestic violence, all of this kind of thing is often the result of unresolved trauma. So how do people respond when they're under threat? What happens to us all when we feel that we are faced with a kind of life-threatening situation? These two are probably the most famous ones. Most people know this, these responses of fight or flight. They're not actually unhealthy. There is nothing wrong with these responses. They are often healthy responses to, be, to feeling under threat and to feeling under attack. Um, when they become problematic, it's when they get very, very stuck, almost like when, when, we, get stuck in that, when we get stuck in that threat response. That's maybe when it, that's, that's when it becomes more problematic for us. Um, and maybe as we go through this, I might encourage you just almost to kind of... Um, check in with yourself and think actually which which of these are most familiar to me and maybe over the past three years which of these responses have come up most strongly for you so the fight response is perhaps the one of the most kind of obvious which is when we feel under attack we attack back we we respond we fight back um and, and again, this can also be shown in, in anger. It's like anger is an important response. It's often a healthy response. It helps us assert ourselves. It helps us to set boundaries. So it's, it's again, it's like none of these things are necessarily unhealthy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about myself. And in the first kind of year or so of 2020, one of the things that I became most aware of was actually like this massive level of anger within myself to what was going on. Um, and I think what I found most difficult was a feeling of powerlessness within that because I didn't know anybody else who I could necessarily organize with or who I could process any of this with other than my husband. So I was really, really stuck in, in in what we might call a kind of uh, yeah, a kind of real rage, rage response, which was quite uncomfortable. Um, okay, so the the second one, the kind of flight response. Again, it's not necessarily anything unhealthy. It's a it's a healthy response to run away. Often, sometimes it's the only uh, option that might be available to us. When it can become problematic for us, sometimes it's when we kind of avoid situations that perhaps it would be more helpful and more productive for us to actually confront. But again, this might be something that you recognize 
Were there maybe situations when you ran away from certain friends, certain situations over the past three years where you were afraid of conflict, where you were afraid of confrontation? Um, certain situations where you knew that there was going to be a lot of kind of COVID, um, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, COVID strictness. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's, I, I can recognize that in myself as well. Okay. Again, the freeze response, this might be really, really familiar to you. Um, it's not necessarily a healthy response. If we think about the animal world, we could say this is when um, an animal just plays dead. Uh, the gazelle caught in the jaws of the lion, it goes completely floppy. And you see sometimes these, these clips on the footage when actually the gazelle, the, the lion accidentally drops the gazelle and the gazelle runs away. It's, it's a survival response. It isn't necessarily a bad thing. When it, again, when it can become problematic is when it really gets stuck. So many people, many children almost employ this freeze response. And I'm pretty sure that this is what will have happened to a lot of children over the past three years where they've had to be in school with the masking, with the fear campaigns, with, with all of the... Um, yeah, with all of the kind of psychological fear campaign, they couldn't run away. Many of them had to go to school. Um, and I think many of them will be, will be stuck in this, this freeze response. So ways that you can identify this happening is, is sometimes what we would call just spacing out. That is a freeze response. If you find yourself zoning out from something. Um, if you find yourself, uh, again, addictions, we could say, well, another way of looking at that could be sometimes it's a freeze response. It's a way of, of, of yeah, zoning out from a situation. Um, I'm thinking about myself, for example, um, maybe sort of spending half an hour on Telegram and, and thinking, oh my goodness, you know, just where's that half an hour just gone? In a way, it's a sort of it's a sort of freeze response or a sort of dissociating uh, from the situation. Exhaustion, massive levels of fatigue. This can also be a sign of a freeze response. Uh, I think so many of us have been in kind of survival mode for the past three years and maybe many of you can really identify with this sometimes just touching into like massive levels of exhaustion and fatigue because it is this constant constant um it, it probably yeah for many of us i think it probably feels like this constant constant battle um i put fainting in because uh this, is, this can also be a freeze response, and um, it's an exam I'll give you an example of it, which happened to me, which was, um, it was in 2022 when most of the mask mandates had been dropped, and I, I had somebody come to the door who, who was doing a survey, and uh, she, she started to ask me questions, and she, she, she was sort of, she was standing outside of, outside of, of the doorstep, and then she wanted to come in. And um, as she came in, she then put on a mask and asked me to, to stand two metres away. And, um, and, I, and I, I, I just remember that, that, that I had these massive levels of rage come up when she said, oh, could you stand over there, please? And I thought, this is my home. What are you, what are you asking me to do here? And, and the next moment, the next thing I knew was I woke up and uh, I was lying on the floor and I'd actually fainted. And... Uh, I think, again, I, I think that is a sort of trauma response. I, da I was actually incredibly angry, but something came in to almost shut that down, and I fainted. So one of the things that most trauma therapists know is that talking about trauma and helping people to just process it through talking is not, it's not enough. So many of these things happen at a physiological, involuntary, le involuntary level. It, that was, it was totally automatic, that response. It wasn't anything that I, that I saw coming at all. Okay, so again, this, this next one might be something that some of you can recognize. So another response to threat, when people feel under threat, can be to... Um, one of the ways to call it is to fawn. 
but I personally don't really like that word because I, it's, it's, it, it sounds too negative. It's, this is a survival response. And if you think about children in situations where they're under threat and they need to preserve that relationship with their caregiver, they will do everything they can to, to make sure that, that that connection remains and, and, and is maintained. And I think that we've seen a huge amount of this over the past three years. Um, and I would say that maybe a lot of, um, a majority of the population have actually responded in, in this way to the, yeah, to the sense of threat. Um, so if, I think the picture shows, shows it quite well in a way. It's like complying, complying with the abuser, befriending, obeying, appeasing. I mean, people, people pleasing in a way, it's, it's, it's a trauma response. It is a way of avoiding, it's a way of avoiding threat. Um, and I think we've seen a huge amount of this over the past three years, people actually going along with something and complying um, so that they actually don't have to kind of face the terror of um, the fact that these, these people do not, do not mean do not mean well. This one is a little bit more complicated, this idea of splitting, and it's not necessarily, um, it, it's, maybe, it's maybe not quite as well known. When I, when I say splitting, I think it's also something that we've seen a huge amount of. Um, splitting is when it's, it's, it's very difficult for us to kind of contain conflicting realities. When it becomes too much, it's almost like we split things off. Um, I think you can see this really clearly in, for example, dissociative identity disorder. So for children who've experienced very, very serious levels of abuse, um, it, it used to be called multiple personality disorder. It's almost like these parts that aren't even aware of each other. So people have, you know, different personalities and they don't even know that they, that they don't know that they exist. Um, but I would say that this happens for all of us at some level and it happens at a societal level as well. So to give an example of this, it would be um, it, it would be actually using labels. It would be it would be using labels to demonize people or to or equally to idealize people. Um, for example, anti vaxxer or um, um, you know, con conspiracy theorist. In a way, these are these are sort of splitting labels where it's like all of the badness is pushed onto onto one group of society. It's like all of that badness is 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 projected onto that group. And and I would say um, that actually this happens on both sides. That it's it's it can be ex when we're under this amount of kind of psychological threat, everybody. Almost everybody does it, um, so you can you can see this on both sides. Um, I'm thinking about my own experience uh, as a as a therapist. Uh, this isn't necessarily anything to do with the past three years, but for example, um, it can be quite. Um, it can happen quite often that a client can, can start to idealize you. If you're able to help somebody, it's, it's probably quite a natural response that somebody would begin to, begin to idealize you and have this, this image of you as a, yeah, as a very, very idealized image of you. Um, and, and, and when you disappoint that person, sometimes when you disappoint the client, it can be very, very difficult for them to almost hold these, these conflicting realities in their, in their mind. It's almost as if um, you're either an angel or you're a devil. Um, and I would argue that most of us are, are much more complex than that. It's, it's yeah, and it's, it's sometimes a, a way of kind of avoiding the pain of dealing with the disappointment. Um, and I've certainly had that experience of kind of letting somebody down and then being really kind of demonized by them. Um, and it's, and it's, also a, it, it, you know, it's also a natural reaction. 
One of the other things that I think has happened over the past few years and that has become really apparent to me is dissociating from the experience. And lots of you might be able to resonate with this, but I've had quite a few people say to me, you know, COVID, COVID is over, Co you know, COVID's over, or the lockdowns are over, you know, let's, let's just move on. And in fact, I even had somebody to tell me to shut up about it, you know, because it's like it's over. Don't, you know. And I think um, what I would say is this, is this is dissociating from the experience, kind of wanting to memory hole it almost. Um, and probably quite a few of you might be aware of this article that appeared in the Atlantic, I think it was, a few months ago, requesting a pandemic amnesty. And um, I really felt she, she lit a touch paper there. Um, I, was really, I was really amazed at, um, at the reaction. Well, I wasn't amazed, actually. I was not surprised at the reaction that it had. Because I think this is it. It was, it was asking that we forget everything that's, that's happened, that we just memory hole it, that we just dissociate from it. And I think, personally, the, the anger that that article um, evoked was a very, very healthy response because I don't think it's um, healthy or good to dissociate from that. Um, yeah, and I, I think the two pictures I put here, I mean, I think fair, fairy tales can sometimes be really kind of helpful in understanding this, um, that they can often, you know, in, in fairy tales, it's like we only see, it's like either the evil stepmother or the fairy godmother. And, and in a way, that is, it's, a, it's a kind of childlike response. That is a kind of childlike way of seeing the world. And one thing that we, um, most of us are just not like that, I would argue. And we're much more complex. Um, okay, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. But this is, um, uh, he's, it's Bessel van der Kolk again. And one of he, his... Um, theories is that there are kind of seven preconditions for um, for trauma or more there are seven preconditions that can actually potentially cause post-traumatic stress which is really kind of what um, is when trauma becomes problematic when it becomes stuck and when it becomes kind of chronic so yeah just maybe have a think about some of these as i go through them and see what you think about whether this kind of links up with any of the the things that have been happening to us over the past three years so a lack of predictability um i think that's kind of pretty obvious uh maybe especially in the per first two years when the, there were these lockdowns we didn't know when there was going to be another lockdown we didn't know if it was possible to meet people we didn't know if it was possible to book a holiday it was th this real lack of predictability and i think that is still something that is is there um and i would probably say um for people who have had the injections i really feel for them because um there is no sense in which they know uh, what this is going to do. There's no predictability there. Um, yeah, there are probably other kind of things that you can think of as well. Yeah, Im immobility with fear and powerlessness. Again, it's, it's pretty obvious. The, the fear campaign, don't kill granny, don't go out, you could kill somebody. Um, and what that has done to children um, is again i don 't think it 's just i don 't think it 's just um, their own the fear for themselves I think it 's actually this terror of could i ki could I actually kill mum or dad? Could I kill my grandmother? Was I responsible for her dying um, so yeah, I think that one 's pretty self explanatory as well um, yeah I mean powerlessness um, Perhaps this kind of resonates with some of you, but again, this, this sense of trying to explain to friends, loved ones, family, what was happening and, and your, your words not being received and, and people making decisions that you felt were, were catastrophic for their health and feeling very powerless to have any, um, any, any influence over that. Loss of connection, again, I think it's, it's, it's very obvious. The, the lockdowns also created that. I think um, this is one of the terrible, invisible 
um, injuries that has been done to us as well that I mean I know many people who who are here this evening and people I've spoken to um, at the meadows before people who've lost friends people who have um, had huge rifts with their families relationships marriages um, being affected by this I think this is part of the invisible damage that we're that we're dealing with numbing and or spacing out um, I mean I don't know if I would necessarily see that as a, a precondition but it's a kind of response again it's, it's like what we were saying before um, and I think I think it's pretty well documented that there was a huge rise in uh, addictions um, in in yeah in, in all kinds of self-harming self-destructive behavior um, over the last two and a half years as well so again I think that that's pretty consistent with 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 this yeah so another precondition that he says c can cause post-traumatic stress can be a loss of sense of time and sequence I mean, I don't know about you, but in 2020 and 21, there were days when I had, I had no idea what day of the week it was. Um, and I, I, I kind of very much kind of lost my lost track of time. Um, even though I was working throughout most of it, I, I made mistakes with, with the days of the week. And I got sometimes I got my appointments confused. Um, a loss of safety. I think that one's pretty obvious. Um, I think safety on so many different levels physical psychological spiritual so many of the things that help us to feel safe help us to feel resourced were not available to us were closed down um, and there was this constant amping up of the threat so I think again that one's very obvious a loss of purpose um, I was very very lucky and I feel hugely grateful that I was able to continue working throughout this um, period uh, but many people weren't and, and one of the most difficult things actually can be a loss of a loss of purpose um, yeah so uh, I think that's many people kind of experience that a loss of trust and betrayal um, I think I don't know about you but um, this is probably one of the biggest ones for me um, I have felt a huge sense of betrayal over the past three years um, a sense of betrayal by my profession um, a sense of betrayal by people who I respect and look up to a sense of betrayal by many of my um, people I, I'm close to, many of the people I love. Um, yeah, I, I mean, to give you, to give you one example, um, there actually there are several of us here tonight. I should say who were members of Therapists for Medical Freedom, and as a collective, um, it was uh, about a month ago we wrote to um, my my professional journal. As a, as a collective, we wrote a letter in response to an article that was about long COVID. So in this article uh, about long COVID, it was, I think it was about supporting, supporting clients who have long COVID. How do we as therapeutic um, practitioners support clients who, who've experienced long COVID? So the article then went on to list the symptoms of long COVID, which include strokes, which include blood clots, which include myocarditis, which include increased risk of Alzheimer's. Uh, and in this article, um, and I'm not necessarily denying the existence of long COVID, but in this article, as you can probably imagine, there was zero mention of, of those things which cannot be named, otherwise we'll all be censored and, and thrown off Twitter. But there was absolutely no mention of these medical injections. So I wrote a letter as an individual um, about this. Uh, we then wrote a letter as a, as a collective. And... Um, I, I recently, it was just this week, in fact, probably the, my other colleagues here will know, um, this, this week uh, I, got my, I got my copy of my journal and I opened it up and, and had to look at the letters page. 
and um, there were two letters that were featured as letters of the week saying thank you so much for giving us this you know this article about long covid it's really terrible how um, clients are you know gaslit and denied and how nobody you know nobody acknowledges them but there was absolutely our letters were not were not printed um, we I, I've written to them several times actually over the past kind of year or so and and none of my letters have been printed there, there's been absolute no response whatsoever um, yeah so I guess for me that's kind of one one experience of feeling feeling betrayed okay so yeah just finally what are some of the ways that we can heal um, and I'd be really interested to hear from some of my colleagues about this as well because I mean these are just these are just some of the things that came up for me um, so the first thing is um, an oasis of safety um, in trauma work one of the one of the things that is most important in helping people to process the trauma is that first they access safety safety and stabilization you cannot work through a trauma if the conditions are not conducive to that people need to be able to feel safe I think there are several ways. I think there's something about find, trying to find that safety within ourselves, and that's something that um, perhaps we might need to work on that might not necessarily be easy. Um, but I think that's one of the most important things. Um, and again, as kind of other trauma therapists here will know, it, these things, they can't be addressed purely through talking and just through, through in cognitive ways. They actually really need to be addressed at the kind of body level. Um, so another oasis of safety is being in being in supportive communities and I think one of the things it, again is like we've been injured we've been abused as a collective and I think it's only as a collective that we'll find healing actually we need to find that we need to find that together um, yeah so this idea of kind of being injured in community and i think we'll find healing in community and i think that's why groups like this are so important actually where where there's sort of it's something constructive that we can do together um and i guess that is the principle of of therapy as well it's like so much trauma happens in relationship and the healing needs to happen in relationship it doesn't happen on your own the other thing is, I guess, being validated, mirrored and supported. And that kind of goes along with, with kind of what we've been saying. Um, I'm, this probably resonates with a lot of you, but I remember the relief that I felt of finding other people. I think that I, I remember when I went to the Meadows in February 2021, and um, it was this huge relief in kind of meeting other people who, who felt like I did. And I think so many of us were really hungering for that. Um, yeah, and again, I think, I think it's Bessel van der Kolk who says this. It's like allowing ourselves to know what we know and facing the terror of the situation. Um, I, again, I think a lot of these things, they can be really felt at a bodily level. I can remember in, I can remember exactly where I was when I was listening to a podcast with Mike Yeadon and it really hit home to me, the, the horror of what was going on and I can feel my stomach just, I can feel it and I, it just absolutely dropped and I can remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. Um, and I think for me, it's, it's facing the terror of the situation, it's facing kind of the lies that go on out there and finding the truth, but also kind of inwardly as well. So um, I, I think it's, it's not just about, it, it's about the lies out there, but it's also kind of facing that within ourselves, I, I would argue. Um, and yeah, allowing ourselves to really feel the grief and the pain that are often underneath this. So in a lot of the kind of rage that we might be feeling, the betrayal, the, the disappointment, um, underneath that, it's really important to allow ourselves to just feel that actually all of these, these friendships, these lost relationships, um, somebody gave me a really good analogy the other day where it was almost like, 
um, there's a train going along the track and then suddenly it kind of diverges and the, t and the two tracks, the, the two train tracks are going like this and sort of moving further and further away from each other and, and there's still opportunities to jump between them but as they continue moving they get further and further apart and, and that's been my feeling with some sort of very close friends actually it's this sense of actually moving moving away m diverging away and 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 that you're not you're not sure if they'll be able to join you where you are um, and I think it's really important that we allow ourselves to feel that because um, again trying to kind of keep the grief trying to keep the pain at bay that is often what results in further trauma addictions um, spacing out it, 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 it becomes sort of a, a cycle in a way um, yeah and then I, I came across this, this title of a book the other day which is um, it's called Gifts from, Gifts from the Devastation and maybe again this is something that resonates with you um, over the past three years um, I feel like I've lost a lot um, I've, I've left I've lost a lot of friendships, I've left certain groups that were really important to me, I felt very let down by my profession, but I've also, my mind has been really opened, it's been really open to a whole load of new, really interesting, amazing ideas, I've met some incredible people, courageous, energetic, intelligent, interesting people. Um, and when I say intelligent, I'm not talking about university educated. And I think that's been one of the biggest kind of learnings for me that um, m many of these people, you know, people with PhDs putting their mask on before they go to the loo. It's like, I'm not intimidated by these people anymore. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. It's like, um, so maybe that's something that resonates with you. I mean, I, um, yeah, I certainly know a lot of incredibly, supposedly intelligent people who've, who've acted in ways that are not that intelligent. Um, and fr friendships as well. I mean, maybe this, again, might, might resonate with you. That I've, there have been friendships that have felt like they've been really fast-tracked. Um, and, and I think those of you, you, you'll know who you are, but there are some people like that for me here tonight, where, and I feel incredibly grateful for that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, there's something about remembering, um, and when I say remembering, um, I'm, I'm almost like talking about the limbs of the body, so if you kind of think about, you know, your arms and your legs as, mem you know, it members, it's like putting ourselves back together again, um, healing the split, um, and not colluding, not colluding in the memory holding, um, I know there are so many people who, who kind of want to, want to forget this. Um, and actually, this is maybe a question for some of my colleagues here, but one of the things that has really kind of fascinated me is um, the, the, past, the, the past three years, COVID, whatever you want to call it, the, um, the, the, the situation has really not been a to much of a topic in my therapeutic work. It's not something that I've... Um, people bring. It's really not something that is talked about and I find that really fascinating and it's, it's a conundrum for me. Is it something that's split off? Um, is it something that's memory hold? I'm, I'm still trying to work that one out um, and it's something that I, I've talked about with colleagues before but we're still kind of, yeah, I, I don't have an easy answer to that one at all. Um, and finally, I think um, healing from some of this is also about kind of being galvanized into action so it's like that fight response that anger is not bad it's about how to find a way to channel channel that into constructive and positive action and again i think this group is a really um, wonderful example of that and I think that being galvanized into action is going to look different for everybody. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about this. It's like we are all different. We are all diverse. And I think we really see how many different gifts that people have. We can see that in this group. Um, everybody has something different to bring. Um, okay. So uh, I think that's about all that I have to say. But I just, came, I just saw this image, which... Um, really kind of made me 
uh, it feels very kind of resonant to what we've been what I've been talking about. Um, some of you probably know this Japanese technique or called kins I think it's called kintsugi, where they, uh, the pot is broken and then the pot, they mend the pot and they bring it back together in a way that is actually much more beautiful. So, um, you know, we saw that image of the kind of the broken cup at the beginning. And I don't think, I don't think healing from this is like necessarily like a, it's not, it's an... It's a, it's a process. It's not something that just happens and everything's okay. But I think, I think ultimately this is what I really hope for us, that we are able to come back together again, but in a way that's more beautiful, but is also different, where we can see all of the different pieces. It's like we're not all the same. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I, I just had this quote from Leonard Cohen that I think is really beautiful, which is, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And I, I think that's what we're, for me, that's part of what we're really experiencing now. There's the darkness, there is all this darkness coming up, but there's also this cracking that is letting in a huge amount of, um, of light. And I think, there's, I think there is real potential in that. Um, so thank you. I think I spoke for a bit longer than half an hour, but um, anyway, I'd be. Thank you. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, really, truly inspirational. Um, I'm sure that people have a lot of questions, uh, would like to talk about their own experiences. Hi, thank you very much. That's been really, and the positivity at the end, it's so important. I just wonder, thinking about the trauma and healing, and it's almost like a journey, a constant journey, almost feels like you're swimming upstream and still... Is it possible to heal from trauma while you still feel that it's still happening around? Yeah. It's almost mm -hmm. um, finding that safe space that you said within all of this can be really difficult, but it may only be, that, or it may be as well, being all together as a safe space to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what your thoughts are on. That. Yeah, I mean, it, well, I, that's, such a, it's, that's such a great question, and I think that's something that came up for me as well. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not... It, 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 out there, it still doesn't feel safe. I, I think probably most of us would, would agree with that, and I think... Um, I mean, I guess there are different things that come up for me, and I'd be really interested to know maybe what some of my other, you know, there, I've got there are other therapists in the audience here tonight who might want to contribute. But um, I guess there's, there's maybe something about how, how do we find ways to find that in ourselves. Um, you know, it's almost like finding that oasis within yourself. Um, and maybe for, for those, those of us who are kind of spiritually minded, it, you know, I think meditation um, I, I think I think connecting connecting with something that feels really eternal I think connecting you know connecting with the natural world um, creativity too. Losing yourself. sorry losing yourself in creativity you know what my hearing's really terrible <laughs> <can> you? <laughs> sorry losing yourself in creativity uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like all your hobbies and, you know, yeah, taking yeah. that time out to sort of just, not zone out, because I know you talked about zoning out, but really getting into that flow where you're yeah. almost not thinking about anything else, just what you're really doing. Um, mm -hmm. And just concentrate and keeping your mind present. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you probably hit you, you hit on something really important there. You okay, know, the, I've got something else. There. <laughs> you were saying about that difference between zoning out uh -huh. and and losing yourself. Uh -huh. I mean, um, yeah, I think that's exactly. It's like getting really involved in something. If you have a hobby, or you know, sometimes I have this in my work um, when you're really kind of in. You know, you're really in the flow. It's totally different, isn't mm -hmm. it, from like mm -hmm. just you know, like being online or something and you think oh my god you know an hour I've just been looking at things about the moon landing yeah. or something you know and I think yeah. <laughs> and I think realizing when you're actually in a loop and, and saying I'm in that feedback loop 
um, and you've got to take yourself out of it because it's not creative and then you end up in the fight or flight thing yeah. and you're triggered and then I think having a sense of fun again is really really important yeah. Um, yeah. and I, for myself um, I just exercise I just increased exercise did more of the things that I could enjoy doing creativity or whatever um, and then my worry was worrying about all mother relatives that have taken you know and and I thought to myself all I can do is do a bit of research to find out what I can help them with um, from a nutritional supplement point of view then I have to drop it I have yeah. to yeah. let go of yeah. other people's and that that was a major thing for me is to let go of other people's yeah. journey yeah because you 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 can't you drive yourself nuts and I know myself I always try and fix people I've got this habit of trying to fix people I've got this mind that always goes when I was wrong yeah <laughs> and I have to let go of that and realize that it's not up to me I can I've got, if there's some knowledge that I've got that I can help them and they come to me now I'll help them with it but I've had to let go of that and just keep my, on my own track and move forward help other people where they want it but that's what we have to do and who knows what's going to happen we don't know we don't know what was in them we, we know the body is amazing um, and yeah. far more amazing than people think yeah and um, more resilient and everything so and I've had to watch my mind there and um, but that is one thing is you've got to let go of that control and yeah. I, I do try to control things like that yeah. and I've learned to, to let that go but I've also learned that you've only got one life and they've tried to disturb our happiness and everything over the past three years and I am determined they're not going to do this for the yeah. rest of my life yeah. and that's that's the way I'm looking at it and I'm almost getting rebellious yeah um, and I'm enjoying the rebellion yeah me too and I'm getting yeah. this fire you know <laughs> and I'm thinking no no this this yeah. you you're not doing this and I'm laughing at them now yeah. and I know there's a lot of devastation but we just have to see what we can do with the devastation yeah. we need to help people um, some people will be on be, be beyond help but we have to have fun and we have to just have that find that that fire inside and I think that helps a lot of the trauma if you can if you can turn something that's been very traumatic and I've got experience of this um, but I've turned it into something really different and it's made me so much stronger Brilliant. so trauma does make you stronger yeah. and I think with kids too they are quite resilient and I think if you can realise, if you can empower the children again that's it'll be lessons to learn but you can also make something really powerful out of this Yeah. so I'll let somebody else talk now yeah. <laughs> 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 Rachel, what a great talk. Um, there's a fantastic number of ideas. And you mentioned uh, a, as a definition of trauma that a person can be at war with themselves. And you then extended that to society. And you drew a, a, a parallel, um, an exact one, with our, our society for the last few years, divided into kind of COVID and anti COVID camps and all the, the, the kind of division there. And it, and it got me thinking about the last gigantic years long trauma of our society. I mean, in uh, Britain here, and that being the wars, mm -hmm. either of them, First World War, Second World War, both of them, and in which society um, suffered from a gigantic trauma with all the uncertainty, you know, the death lists daily and waiting in telegrams and, you know, and hearing of it, and this going on for years. But, but in, when, it, when it was over, when both wars were over, we could come together because we'd all shared that trauma. Equally, there was no one, that, I mean, the enemy, the Germans or the Japanese, they were excluded, they were the bad guys, but for ourselves, there was a terrific sense of solidarity. You, you, you couldn't pick in anyone, we'd all suffered equally, you know, the richest person to the poorest, it happened to everyone. And when the war was over, we, we were able to, to have strategies, like, uh, societal strategies to ad address this trauma, 
you know, we had our monuments, we had our rituals, we had all the, 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 the flourishing of different types of art that addressed that and, and explained it and made people feel better. And for a long time, I think, you know, like arguably maybe up to relatively recently, society ab about those two episodes could have a big kind of collective cuddle with itself, thinking we were the good guys, there was no one in Britain that was a baddie, and that was the Germans and Japanese, but now in Britain, and I guess this applies to lots of countries in the world, their own society is divided into at least two warring groups. Uh, and, and that nice analogy with the, the, you know, the two, the, the trains running on parallel tracks and your friends going off that mm -hmm. way and you're going that way. And that's not to mention the ones where the, you ended up getting on completely different trains and mm -hmm. different stations. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? I know you have got solutions that can address a person's trauma when they're divided among themselves. But what do we do as a society? We can't have the big rituals that we had at the end of the war because we don't share that. So what do, what do we do to try and fix, to heal the, the, the two sides in this? Um, so mm. that, that was my question. Yeah. Thanks. So, that's, yeah. a, that's a nice, easy question. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a tiny little answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> give me, give me no the, pressure. Give me the answer that's <laughs> on it. <laughs> Um, Sorry, but I know it's like there's, there's not an answer, but no, but I'm just thinking we could all go to church, but to what? We're going to make yeah. a monument to, to whom? To us? Yeah. To the victims of long COVID? Uh -huh. What? You know, yeah. the magazine that you're talking about, they've yeah. mentioned in long COVID, and you're thinking. I don't think you know, our institutions it. They, they haven't, they're, they're yeah. done, aren't they? I think yeah. that's it now. That's it. Thinking about you know my profession and what will happen and and whether I will continue to do the work in the same way that I do. Um, I I don't know for how much longer I can work for an organisation which has been so silent on this. So maybe what I will do will be will be something different and it might take a different form. I mean I think other people here probably have better answers on this than me. I guess one of the things that kind of makes me feel really hopeful is that, um, you know, a lot of the kind of responses are really grassroots. All of this stuff is coming from people. It's not coming from these big institutions. They're, they haven't got the answers. They're, you know, that most people have like, a lot of people have lost total trust in most of our institutions and so for me I mean it was like um, this march that uh, well Katrina was definitely there weren't you on Saturday and um, and it was like wow this is so diverse it's this is really amazing and and well maybe there weren't that many like guard I was a guard used to be a guardian reader and I mean there weren't many people like that there but um, but uh, but, uh, but it was still pretty diverse and it's like wow this is this is amazing this is and that's kind of what gives me hope the, the fact that um, it, it maybe it isn't going to be organized in the way that that we've known it before but maybe it's you know all these it's like all these little groups it's like things like this or these marches or you know that all that incredible um that truth be told campaign it's like all of this stuff is happening at a really really grassroots level so that's kind of what gives me that that's what gives me hope um yeah i mean i don't know if that really answers your question but um yeah, that's that's what I would. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, maybe, maybe there are people who wouldn't agree with me on this, but one of the things that I was really struggling with is like, so Gabor Mate, for example, who I, um, many, maybe some people here know, you know, he's a doctor, but he's also a kind of trauma therapist. And I, you know, I love his books. I love his talks. Um, I've got a lot out of his, um, I've got a lot out of them. Um, his film, The Wisdom of Trauma, I totally recommend it if you haven't seen it. It's brilliant. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot from, from his work. But he's saying that people who didn't take the didn't take the injection um, were, were suffering from unhealed um, unhealed trauma, <laughs> and and it's like what am I what you know? Um, and I was I mean I know a lot of people who were really really just like horrified, gutted, felt betrayed, and I could you know part of me could say right that's it you're dead to me I'm not. You know, we're not having. But he's got skeletons in his closet. He was mean to say it. I'm beginning to. Oh, sorry, beginning to think there's a lot of people with skeletons in their closet that are being oh, blackmailed because yeah. yeah. it doesn't make a lot of it doesn't make any sense. That happened to me with Dolly Parton. Were you in her closet? Dolly was there. Tell us. Tell us. <laughs> That's far more interesting. I can, co- I can cope with the Dolly Parton thing. Yeah. YouTube's and things, you all, you all get the back show and, you know, yeah. you know, and uh, I'm yeah. getting mine now, you know. And, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. So anyway, sorry. But, 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 you know, if you, if you just kind of respond in this way where you say, right, that's it. Um, I think, you know, I guess it's like we have to deal with that disappointment. And actually, what it maybe what it is, it's like you just have to take them down off a pedestal. And it's like, to, to, you know, it's like reclaiming your own authority, isn't it? It's like, yes, there are thing, there are still things that I'm going to take from his work, but but it's taking this person down off a pedestal and realizing he's a flawed human being, um, as we all are. Maybe some are more flawed than others. Hi. Uh, my name's Sam, and I'm a recovering counsellor. <laughs> um, I'm definitely suffering from p- PTSD, and everything you said, absolutely a mirror for that. Um, well done. I, I wish the, the only regret I've ever had from not having any social media or looking at the news or a television for 20 years is the fact that I didn't find you guys. Um, but I found you all eventually through Stand in the Park. It was something I wanted to offer to Glenn, really. What can we do to bring the humanity back, that connection? And one of the things I've started doing with people when I meet new people is just automatically hugging them. Mm. And there's a few seconds where you're going in and you can see... (laughs) (laughs) Um, But rather than offering the hand, you know, that British thing, um, going in with the hug, nine and a half times out of ten, they seem to be remembering, oh, yeah, this is the thing we used to do. So that seems to be working even with the people that I wouldn't dare declare my position with. Yeah. Thank you for that contribution. Yeah, I think it's it's, it's brilliant actually. Yeah, uh, Chris, Chris from here. I really love the the talk as well. I think it it goes uh, a long way in in analyzing what just happened. You know, through these through these years. Uh, I, I want to ask you uh, on a kind of more uh, individual level. We talked about a bit societal level as well. Uh, do you have any examples, maybe in your life or maybe someone else's life that you know of, uh, how they bridge that gap between those people that were going on a different tracks? You know, how how they. Met Managed to 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 get get on one track. Uh, maybe you can you can tell us some success stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what your name is. Sorry, but uh, me? yeah, Wendy. Uh, Wendy. I I think I'm I'm kind of with what Wendy said actually about sometimes having to let go. I think um, you you can you can be authentic and you can say what you feel. Um, and, and I think you have to respect, you know, part of um, the whole ethos of counselling should be to kind of respect a person's autonomy. And, um, and I think you have to respect that person's timeline. And um, I think you can, um, I think you can say, I think you can, it, 
you, you can own your feelings and you can you can you can voice your opinion but in the end I think you have to let go and and that's maybe the really really for me I think that's the very very hard part I mean I've had to do that with my family where um, you know I've said all this kind of stuff and they think I'm completely you know I think my mum phoned up Paul and it was just like she was worried I was having some kind of psychotic breakdown you know it was like I started banging on about the great reset and 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 it's like i i've put all i've said all this stuff and it's in the end it's like you have to you have to let go i think and allow people to to make their choices um have i have i am i thinking of any um so no i i <laughs> I wouldn't kind of say it in, like, about converting anybody. I don't think it's possible to convert somebody. People come to this when they're ready. You know, I think they come when they're ready. It's like, I, I mean, I, so um, four years ago, somebody tried to red pill me about 9-11, um, and I was a bit late to the... I was a bit late on that one, but um, very late on that one. And I can remember that, put, so she was telling me about all of this, and I just went like this. I was like, you're complete, oh my God, you're totally barking. Um, and I think about that a lot because I think, well, I've had that experience when I've told people, actually, this doesn't stop transmission. I had that. Somebody just went like this and, and I told her. And, um, and I think, well, I've been that person. I've, I've been that person who wasn't open to it and wasn't ready. And, um, and so I think it's like you can, it's like maybe people just come to this when they're ready you know and it's it's really frustrating and it's really hard you know uh, I just wanted to like potentially expand on what you were saying without this specific like not specifically to do with your promotional campaign with pizza but say simply I think maybe a lot of us saw like the article that came out this week uh, where they were uh, just kind of uh, framing uh, the, uh, the unvaccinated in a terrible light um, where we're simultaneously uh, I, I thought it was really curious that they said there were anti-vaxxers in the article um, who have like won the bet or whatever but they were still using anti-vaxxers which is a name like it's a moniker which has a pejorative meaning yeah. baked into it I think right like anti, to, to say like anti-vaxxer I think it's an impl implication of like uh, ignorance um, and so simultaneously they're saying we're ignorant and also we knew better and we didn't tell them yeah. and this is uh, reminiscent I think absolutely ridiculous so I would agree with you yes definitely marketing can be used to, to, to manufacture consent as Chomsky would put it you know and then Chomsky was saying that people what was it he said specifically something about prisons if you don't get vaccinated so f that was that was fantastic uh, 180 there from uh, manufacturing consent but um, anyways what I'm trying to say is my, my little brother uh, what was very interesting in a, in a profoundly macabre way uh, was that as we were going through the lockdowns, I started speaking to him after the first jab um, because it, before, up until that point, my spidey senses were tingling. While I was planning to get jabbed myself, uh, like I changed my mind right before, but I intended to because I, I thought the scale of the, the horror was such that it was incomprehensible, you know? You couldn't. It was just so difficult, like you were saying, you felt it viscerally in your stomach when it, you kind of realized. And I think that when, I, when it dawned on me, it was like three days of periodic crying and just kind of wandering around and just letting it process. That there's this subtle but significant distinction, I think, rather than us being led by people that are avaricious and so financially led that they inadvertently create this horrible inequality and horrible state of like poverty and, uh, and, um, and concentration of wealth systemically. It's not like they're doing it by accident chasing wealth. They're doing it deliberately to hurt us. They're trying to, this is a depopulation campaign, it seems. You know, it may or may not be. That seems to be my impression of what, based on what's happened. And um, so anyways, yeah, so talking at the beginning of this, and I don't, I don't want to ask too long a question. I'm just going to try and make this as brief as I can, but obviously it's a very, anyways. Um, I was talking to my brother, and up until then I told my family, my parents and my brother, there's no long-term safety data here, and this was really as much as I could say. There's no long-term safety data. So you can say trust the science, but there is no science. Um, and so to that end, you know, 
it's not good. And um, then after the first one came out, there started to be some reactions, some negative reactions coming back. And I started to speak to my brother at this time, and I said, hey, look, there's these negative reactions coming back now. And he went to anger. He said to me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you had any suspicion that this could be bad, why didn't you tell me? And, on, and then, which is, is what this article was doing, so it's very, you know, triggering to read this article, honestly, this week, and be like, holy crap, because... This is what happened with my brother. And then my brother went from being very angry with me and, and an ill-advised righteous indignation towards me. Uh, because I did talk to him about it. He just, he'd forgotten. He'd deliberately forgotten about it. Anyways, so I spoke to him about it. Then he doubled down and ended up getting the second one. And then he was there front line ready to get the third one the day that it was announced that it could be done. And he volunteered and went in and got it as quickly as he could. And, uh, and now it's a situation where uh, I can't even speak to him about Mm -hmm. He's like really, um, I can't even speak to him about it. Uh, mm -hmm. and so like that relationship has been absolutely destroyed as his relationship with my parents in many ways. Then my mom's slowly coming to see the light now, thank goodness. But um, I guess my question is, what is that happening? What's happening there psychologically when somebody gets really, really angry? They go like 100% the opposite way and then they double down again. This like... Yeah. Radically shifting paradigms uh, uh, carried on the the wings of anger. What, like, how does that happen? And mm. is, I don't know if that's a, a, a question. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I'm really sorry about what's happened with your brother. That just feels such a like. That's. I think so many of us have had that experience, haven't we? Of of a loved one making a decision like that, and then the kind of relationship really breaking down. Um, I mean, other people, <laughs> other people may have a different view on this. Um, I guess there's some. <laughs> I mean, for me, like that whole experience. I mean, I wouldn't have said I was naive before, but um, this whole experience of having your kind of world view completely turned upside down. It was kind of traumatic. It was like reality for me, like reality totally shattered, and. Um, I think, I think, you know, maybe the anger sometimes is when people are presented with this, co you know, what we call cognitive dissonance. It's like reality out there is, 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 not, is not matching up with, with you know, what, what they're actually doing. So I think sometimes when, you know, when you're presented with something that on some level makes sense to you, but you don't want to admit, it's like you, it's like you go into that fight. It's the fight response because it's like this is threatening to me. You know, go away with your crazy facts you know and um i think i think that's what happens it's like people are, are defending this tooth and nail and um i mean i think it was jung who said something like there is no coming to consciousness without pain mm -hmm. it's 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 painful it is painful to realize all this stuff that you've been lied to that the world as you thought it was is is is, is it's not like that it's kind of liberating but it's also really painful and i think for, you know it maybe people it's like for some people it might take a real real catastrophe to wake them up and for some people they they will die and um, and for me, this is that point where, um, you know, you, you kind of told him, you told him what you were feeling. You said to him and, you know, he has that he has that choice. The information is there if you if you want to see it. And it, um, so that would be that would be my response to it. I mean, other people might have something different to say but I think it's really common to have that reaction because it's like that you know your beliefs your your beliefs are threatened your, your beliefs they're not just like something in your head it's like I think it's part of your being it's like you know I, Charles Eisenstein who's a writer I really like he kind of talks about you know beliefs are an extension of your way of being and when that is threatened it, yeah you go on the attack or you kind of withdraw so it takes a lot to kind of overturn that I think um, yeah, that would be my kind of view on it anyway. Okay, um, <clears throat> sorry. Hello, hi. Hi, uh, yeah. Thanks very much. It was really good. I really enjoyed that. Um, I, I, until tonight, I've been totally alone, so I'm feeling a bit. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, yeah, great. <laughs> um, anyway, about the moon landings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that is, I did, I managed to convince, I managed to convince him the other day. It, so I did have an experience of... Bacon game. Um, 
No, right. Okay, so I'm just going to bullet point because, uh, yeah, a bit nervous. But um, so my situation, right? So I've lost everyone. Okay. Um, my mum, my last parent, died at the end of 2019. So when this all started, I was already kind of in trauma anyway because uh, me, and my mum, were tight, you know. And uh, and then I, I, I think it's. I sort of did panic about the whole thing, ish. But then that night, I think it would be the twenty third. You've got Boris Johnson on the telly saying, "Go to work, but don't go to work, but go to work." <laughs> and I, like, I'm really common and working class, but I do study psychology ever since Dr. Peterson arrived. <laughs> um, and um, and I got what that was. I was just like, "You are creating a cognitive uh-huh. dissonance there." You're doing that yeah. on purpose. Yeah. And, and, and at that moment, I think something broke in my head. And I went into a bit of a psychosis mm, yeah. um, for a few days, mm-hmm. uh, at least. And then, um, so I did the lockdown thing because I'd been fired anyway, because we were all fired from Camera Obscura. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, mm. That oh. was a tour guide up there. Right, okay. Uh, and this is what I mean. Like, I used to be the most outgoing person. I could do that show, no problem. Mm. And now I'm just, I'm, now I'm a cleaner. Uh, sorry, no, I, there's nothing wrong with I being a cleaner. Some very, I, have, well, I know very good, another very good cleaner who's here this evening. And hey, who, cleaners yeah. of the world, you know. So, um, shout out to the cleaners. Sorry, I, I yeah. want to keep my point brief, sorry. Um, so I, I, I lost my sister over all of this. She's mm. thrice jabbed, six strokes. Um, mm. and still with us, but she won't talk to me. Mm. My brother, I still talk to. He told me he pitied me. Um, mm. And ever since then, I just decided it's a no-go. So I totally feel what you're feeling, mate. Um, and I just decided it's, we just don't talk about this because you're my brother and I'm not sacrificing that relationship uh-huh. over this. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just don't talk about it. We'll have these really weird conversations. It's just weird. Um, I lost all my friends except for one who still loves me because I make him laugh because he thinks I'm nuts. Um, and, and he actively comes to me for conspiracy stories and stuff like that. Sorry, I wasn't where I was going, sorry. Um, and then I ended up in this phase, especially when they started with the mandatory masks, I was just like, right, no, that is it. I am not wearing a mask. And, and I'm not a very brave person, OK? Uh, and I'm, I'm a... I guess I would have been before, I would have been, what's that picture about the the one where the person's trying to make the other person happy, the appeasement yeah. sort of one? Uh-huh. I would have done that because I hate confrontation and yeah, I hate all too. that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but walking through, and it's so walking through little, walking through Waitrose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Comedy, you, know. I, yeah. you should have seen the camera obscura show, mate. But walking through, walking through the supermarkets and all that, without the mask, and it was just like I, I felt like I was fighting a, a war on my own. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, I, so I totally. Get, and that sounds ridiculous. Sounds it's actually been in the army. Sorry, if any of you have. That's ridiculous. But it felt like that at the time. Yeah. And every day was more of the same for almost two years. Yeah. I couldn't hold the job down. I got other jobs, and I couldn't hold them down because I kept fighting with people. Mm. Um, I've, I've got a job as a cleaner because I thought. Nobody bothers cleaners, and that's pretty true. We, we kind of get left alone to, to, to do what we want to do. Anyway, uh, long short of it all, is I've gone through this whole process of what Jung would call ego death, okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have absolutely no flipping idea who I am anymore, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I, that's kind of terrifying. And I don't know how to... I, I, not fix it, but it's it's terrifying and, and, and intriguing in, in the same way because I found there are depths to me that I didn't know. I, I thought it was quite a shallow person, <laughs> um, yeah. but I, and I found that I have a backbone that I didn't know I had mm-hmm. when I when mm-hmm. it really came to it. And I and I and for anybody that does follow Dr. Peterson, he's got a big thing about it. And I know I, I know I would not be a Nazi, you know, if it came to it. If mm-hmm. I was living in the thirties, I know I wouldn't mm-hmm. be. Um, but I don't know who I am, mm-hmm. and 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 I 
uh, like I say, I feel very alone about this because I've I've gone to, I've gone to the meadows and none of you were there. Were there? I think I went to the wrong bit. I think you were all because <laughs> you have all met at the meadows. I kept going for weeks. And all I, all I bumped into was that some people that were doing this sort of sword and sorcery role play stuff. Uh, and I was like, I was like, Barry, that'll be them. We're going to win this. Uh, but but they, 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 they laughed at me as well. And I, I didn't have a point. I'm sorry, I just wanted to chat. I, no, that was really good. Yeah, I really. I just needed to say something because I've not been able to say something to anyone yeah. for three years. Yeah. And um, psychosis is thinking and feeling differently from the normal person. So we are, we were all the same as you. <laughs> but but I, I want to say that I was really lucky during this, I, and I lost people as well, lots of friends and things. But I very quickly met up with the stand in the park and things. But if I'd gone through this the way you have, having nobody. If I didn't have all, all these amazing mm. people around me, I, I, would, I don't know if I would be here. So I think you are super brave. <laughs> I think you are super brave because yeah. we've had each other and you haven't. So we've got, we've got that bond and so we're ready with open arms and proper hugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask a question about, uh, is your profession uh, going to need to develop whole new skills for this challenge that we're in now? Because as Glenn was describing, I feel the same, this is very much a war, but what we don't have any sign of coming anytime soon is an end of hostilities, whether it's a manufactured day on a Masonic holiday or God knows what, where they will declare that hostilities are over and strike deals. We have no obvious end of hostilities. Deployed weapons, including lies, are rolling on and having their injury upon us. Enough people vaccinated could be injured for years. So there isn't any obvious end to hostilities coming where we can run out in the street and kiss strangers and think this is all over. So we've got a very different challenge. I don't know how we hit that safe moment, if that is similar to a safe space where we all suddenly feel hostilities are over. We can then build bridges, put up monuments, make friends again, uh, because the hostilities aren't over. There was always unexploded bombs and they dug up the few dead bodies that they didn't know about that were blown up and so some of the trauma continued after the war, but it was mostly appeased after armistice, etc. We don't have an obvious end to hostilities. There may be a Nuremberg trials, but one of the traumas for us is we no longer trust anybody. We struggle to trust ourselves because we're learning things which we didn't know before. So trust is really out the window. It feels as if your profession and all of us together are going to have to learn some sort of whole new skill set among us and with your help and guidance in order to get through this. And we can't necessarily wait to get started on that for an end to hostilities. Because these hostilities could go on for the rest of our lives where we're arguing about lies, whether it's climate change or the pandemic, or how people have died over the next 10 years from things that were actually happened to them two years ago. So all these uncertainties and the trauma of that rolling on and on and on among us. I'm just wondering, do you think you have any prospect of amongst the awoken side of your community, not the ones who were complicit in this, uh, developing new skills, perhaps with our, all of us together, to help us get through it while it's happening? Because I'm not sure there's going to be an obvious end point uh, during maybe even our lifetime. Hi. Thank you, Rachel. A great talk. And uh, that's a, I don't know, very difficult, nuanced sort of question, but I don't think there's any one answer to that. My sense is that we've all got different roles to play in this. We're not all therapists. I happen to be a therapist and a movement embodiment teacher. That's my way of helping people integrate, helping people to 
really reach a trust in their own body of themselves and to feel that. So I think there's a certain degree of healing ourselves to the point where we can trust our own feelings about things. No, no longer putting authority out there. I mean, I listened to a brilliant podcast with these guys about all these. You talked to me, you mentioned Gabor Mati, but talking about all these so called spiritual teachers, you know, uh, Dalai Lama getting jabbed on the telly and all this sort of thing. You know, my own teachers who I've followed for years, intimately on retreats and everything, some of them went along with this, you know, or. And it's. It's a case of just going into your own sovereignty, going into what, what you can do and what, what you can do with the people around you, really. Um, what you, you were talking about is, I, I was thinking there's maybe ways of having collaborative approaches with people of different disciplines in the, ther um, in the therapeutic sphere. So in, in the therapeutic sphere, are using sound, using movement, using different therapeutic approaches together, maybe doing group sessions with numbers of people. Um, I know like the, the work of like Thomas Hubel and things like that talks about um, trauma healing on a, on a group level rather than just individual. Um, how that looks, I've no idea. I've not got all the answers to that. But I think the, the, new, the new skills, I think, they're not necessarily new. I think they've always been at the core of what mm -hmm. true inquiry and true healing is. Mm -hmm. which is about self-knowledge, essentially, and meeting everything that there is to meeting ourselves. Um, and I think that also works in a dynamic of being able to spread the message to the people that are beginning to question. Because if I've not done my own work, I'm too angry to speak to anybody. I, I found this in the early part of this. I'd, so I, I created an isolation from my daughter, for example, from even my son, uh, and my mother, she just, you know, put the barriers up. Quite amazing to me. Um, I was no longer sort of trying to throw it, push it down her neck or anything like that. My two brothers, t twin older brothers, I, I was, I tried to, uh, very, one of them was a carer. He got jabbed right at the very beginning when I didn't know that much about it. I did say I didn't think it was a good idea. His other twin brother got jabbed much, much later, and I gave him all the information, everything. And he still went ahead and he says, oh, I'm just yeah. going to get it to protect myself. But I guess there's no easy answers, you know, that it actually coming for the heart, coming for a place of kindness and caring about those around and, and even those that are not seen. That's the difficult one is to include them somehow in a, a heartfelt place of compassion and maybe that will start to dissolve the, the mass psychosis that they're under. Yeah. The, you know, the mass form talk about mass formation. And the, there's a very sort of famous sort of German psychologist talks about mm -hmm. that. He's given long talks on that. Um, and so I think there's, there are people that will be therapists helping others that are already awake to heal and, and get through their own stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but they'll also be, once those have reached a certain level of congruency in their own nature, their own mission start to emerge and their own passion about how they can serve in this new world. Some of them might be catalysts for bringing the new information. Some of them might be marketing experts that can start to undo some of the programming that's been done. But I'm just feeling it here. <laughs> mm. Mm. I guess it's coming for the heart. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, I'd just like to thank everybody who's spoken uh, for their uh, fantastic contributions. Uh, and it's given us uh, an awful lot of uh, food for thought. Um, I've got a PhD. I'm in academia. <laughs> <laughs> Disillusion doesn't really cover it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I just, just thinking about my own experience, um, uh, I went to university, I learned all about um, ecology. Uh, and then I went and did a PhD after that. And I went out into the real world 
And what I found in the real world was they'd been telling me lies the whole time at university. Uh, they'd produced a model of what they wanted the world to look like. And when I went out there, it wasn't like that at all. And I had to start from the beginning again. And I, I don't know, I think this is an opportunity for us to start from the beginning again. Mm. And uh, talks like this have been immensely helpful. So thank you very much indeed, Rachel. Thank you.